communities. And I think just the range of his titles, DuPont Professor of Materials Chemistry and Physics, Professor of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology, the Associate Director for the Penn State Materials Research Science and Engineering Center, and the Director of the Center for Solar Nanomaterials. So he's got all sorts of different hats that he wears here. And some of you may have interacted with Tom in his hat as an Associate Editor for JACS, as he maybe sends you papers to review, hopefully doesn't treat your papers too badly. So those are sort of the nuts and bolts of the rock star aspects of Tom. Is there any dirt on Tom? I probably do have a lot of dirt on Tom, because I have known Tom for many years and have spent many, many Gordon conferences up way too late, drinking far too much, and I think that's the problem. I do have a lot of dirt on Tom, but I can't remember any of that dirt on Tom. So I go to the next thing, which is Ask the Google, and guess what came up very high in the list? So if you read through the comments from the students, first of all, he teaches a challenging, fast-paced, hard class, but oh, he is just so supportive. He's available for help all the time, and he's just such a sweetie. So can't get any better than that. Then I found another site, which is a blog from Nature Chemistry, which was a short interview with Tom and found some interesting factoids. For example, the historical figure that Tom would most like to dine with, without singling anyone out, I'd like to have dinner with the people who founded religions to see if any of them had an idea of the kind of trouble they were starting. And when asked what one book and one musical album he would like if he were stranded on a desert island, ever the practical aspect, I'd like to know how to build a sailboat from driftwood and palm fronds. And then you can see a little bit of his musical taste there as well. There's one burning question that I want to ask Tom, and that is his answer to the following Viper quote. I'll see you when I'm going to put up here. And I know, I listened carefully, and I know how Ray and Amy would answer this question. So how do you pronounce that word? Yes! Yes! So I invite you all to visit this link. This has been a long, ongoing, heated debate within the Ionic Viper group. This is a poll I put up very early on. We've got 42 votes. It's kind of buried. You can't find it in our usual polls. But here's the link. If all of you want to log on and vote how you pronounce this, you can see we have some strong opinions there. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Tom. Thanks, Maggie. I don't know where you got that stuff. It's on a hard work. Possible orientations here. Here we go. Okay, well, it is a great pleasure to be here, and a pleasure in so many ways. First, it's a wonderful group, and I really enjoyed meeting everyone. And second, it's great to see my old friends again, and even if they want to make fun of me, that's okay. And I didn't really know what paper to choose for this workshop. Actually, we do a lot of nanochemistry in my group these days, and not a lot of it, at least at the moment, well, that's not really true. There just aren't that many recent publications on what I call real solid-state chemistry for energy, although that's changing a little bit. Anyway, what happened was I asked Barb to pick a paper, and she picked a paper on semiconductor nanowires from 2011. I have to confess, we're not actually working on this anymore, and I'll explain why. And the story is a lot like the one you heard from Amy in many ways, but there are some differences, particularly in the sense that this involves nanowires, which are special in certain ways, 
and uh, uh, techniques that are used to make not just semiconductor nanowires, but other kinds as well, that have lots of interesting properties. So um, just to start off, though, from the point of view of, of uh, pedagogy, teaching inorganic chemistry, I love teaching about semiconductors in my Chem 310, my sophomore inorganic course, uh, because there's, it's really rich in, in concepts that uh, help students uh, understand, or hopefully understand, something about how electrons behave in solids. And then it really touches on this, this world of devices that are, are really important for, you know, that these are devices that everybody runs into, at least the, the diode, the LED, and the, and the FET, essentially every day of their life. And uh, the, the photodiode, the solar cell, is a very important one for, for energy applications. And so what I hope for my inorganic students is by the end of the course, they will, they will get it, and they will know how these things work and really have a sense of the structures, how electrons behave, some, uh, some idea of how con conduction occurs in, in, in metals and in semiconductors, and then, and then how these basic devices work. I, I want to point out, by the way, this picture, you know, there's, chemistry is connected in so many ways. And, and this picture of the electron in the dope semiconductor, so this would be silicon with a phosphorus uh, here, and then this electron is basically, it basically thinks it's in a hydrogen atom, but it's a funny hydrogen atom, right? Because it's, the dielectric constant is very large, but it's basically a spherical potential function, and that's all the electron knows. And so Maggie showed this picture of the, the Fermi level of the N-type semiconductor uh, right below the conduction band edge. But if you look carefully, actually, there's a whole series of hydrogen-like uh, energy states there, N equals one, two, three, four to infinity. And uh, out, out in the very far infrared, you can see those uh, spectrums. So anyway, this is, uh, this is the, the why the, this subject is important pedagogically. Um, and the other thing we learn, of course, from this is, is we reinforce something about periodic trends. So if you think about band gaps and think about the trends for the, for the p-block elements, um, we know that the band gaps, if you pick, uh, let's say, group four, we know that the band gap starts off large with carbon and decreases going down the group. So if you uh, kind of shade it, the you know, red, the black is down here. And then, you know, why is that? Why does the band gap start at 5 eV down here and end up at you know, 0.7 and finally 0 0.2 eV down there? Anybody explain that at the freshman chemistry level? My students never came when I asked them, but then after I explained it. Yeah, I, I mean, the way, the way I explain it is to think about what makes a bond, right? What makes the difference between a bonding and antibonding orbital? The, it's, it's I mean, there, there is uh, uh, some quantum mechanics in it, but, but, but basically it's an electrostatic Traction of the electron for the for the two nuclei in question, and and up here uh, we're we're dealing with electrons in the second principal quantum shell. Down here, third, fourth, fifth. So uh, those electrons are farther and farther from the nucleus. Uh, so so if you think about it, you know these guys are these guys are playing penny ante poker down here. The difference between a bonding and anti bonding orbital. That's when you're losing a penny any poker hand. Up here, they're, they're, you know, it's a thousand dollars, thousand dollar ante to get in the game. And then there's also this progression of band gaps as you go from group four to three, five, two, six, and one, seven, whereas the electronegativity difference gets bigger, the band gap also gets bigger. So what's, what's the freshman chemistry concept there? We explain why if you have germanium and it's 0.7 eV band gap, and you substitute one atom to the left, one to the right, so it's completely isoelectronic, but you introduce a little polarity and the band gap gets bigger. So 
So again, nobody ever gets this one, so I don't feel bad. But, but you know, it's just basically this MO picture, right? So we start with the, you know, if you draw the MO picture for the hydrogen molecule, it looks like that. If you draw it for something polar, it looks like that. And of course, if you start with an offset between your basis orbitals, you're going to get um, a bigger splitting between the bonding and antibonding levels when you're done. And that's what that's what we're doing. Here. Okay. And so, you know, this is uh, there's a very rich set of combinations of things you can make out of these elements, uh, always keeping the total number of electrons four per atom, and you make a semiconductor every time. And the band gap varies according to those two rules. So, so actually, I only have half an hour, but I want I, I have a demonstration that, that goes with this, and um, it's a liquid nitrogen demonstration. And, uh, involving light emitting diodes. Okay, so so I've got some some LEDs here, and this one is a. Uh, orange LED. Let's see if I can put this up. Okay. These are all gallium arsenide phosphide. Okay. And can, can everybody see the colors? We need to dim the lights in here a little bit. Maybe I'll black the screen. So it's not so bright behind me. Can you see that? Okay. So this one, this one is is orange and in this one well, it doesn't light up at all because I have it backwards. It only works in one direction because it's a diode after all. This one's yellow, okay? And so this one has a higher or lower Larger or smaller band gap than the orange one. Yellow light, more energy, right? And this one has a little more phosphorus relative to arsenic than the orange one. Now, the fun thing about the liquid nitrogen part is I can dunk, uh, dunk this. Let me do the orange one because sort of, that's a little more striking change. I can dump the orange LED in the liquid nitrogen, and something happens. Two things happen. What do you notice? The color got brighter, and the color changed. Which way did the color go? To higher or lower energy? Higher energy, right. And that happens with all of them, actually. So if we do this with the... Um, I might have a green one over here. Let's see. I've got a 50% chance of getting this over here. There's a green one. And so what color do we expect this one to turn? Kind of blue-green. It gets a little brighter. They all get a little brighter. And they all get a little bluer. So um, then the question is, um, excuse me, it's a little um, So then the the question is, why do they get um, why do they get bluer first? If if I've got this this kind of band picture. Um, something is is making that energy gap bigger when the thing gets colder. What's what's going on there? Yeah, so, yeah, the lattice is shrinking, and so the overlap is getting better, and so the levels are splitting apart more. Okay, and now why does it get brighter? This is the one in my inorganic class. No one gets this right. So I, it used to be, back when this was a junior senior class, I would offer a case of beer or anyone get this problem right. And only one guy ever got it right, and I did deliver it on the case of beer. Hmm? 
it is an, that is the efficiency of, of emission, the, the current efficiency of emission is getting higher. That's true. And the question is why. Yes. And so? So the same thing happens with a fluorescent molecule, right? What, what, when you cool a, fluor, a fluorescent molecule down, it gets way brighter. And how do we explain that to our students? Well, we draw the parabolas later. But, but basically, it's a thermally activated, the non-radiant decay is thermally activated. You've got to climb up that excited state well to reach the point where it overlaps with the ground state parabola near the classical turning point for the equation. So, but of course, the students have learned this in physical chemistry, but in different words. And they, but it's great. When you offer a case of beer to your students, everybody wants to take a guess. And it's the most lively class in the whole, the whole semester. Okay. So, all right. So the other thing about semiconductors, of course, it's important, is, is solar cells. And, and Amy pointed out yesterday why this is so important. But this is also a good teaching moment. If you think about the fact that 1240 nanometers equals one electron volt, and visible light is between 400 and, say, 700 nanometers, how, what, what can a visible photon do for you? Well, if you compare that energy in units, it's about the same as the energy of a potential energy of an electron in a strong bond. One electron. So, so a good electron pair bond is 400 kilojoules per mole of CH bond. So that's about the energy of the electron in that bond. Also, coincidentally, it's the, it's the energy of an electron stored in a typical battery. So sunlight can do a photochemical reaction, give you a sunburn. It can make hydrogen from water and charge a battery. The second two are useful for energy conversion if we can figure out how to get them together. And there's, those are just going to be solar talks. There's a set of slides that's circulating. I noticed, I took out all the other ones that Amy had, but I left this one in because I like this. This is a, this is a picture from NASA of the world at night. And you can show this to your students and you can ask them what's wrong with this picture. Right? And, and so that eventually they'll figure out it's not night everywhere at the same time. So it's a composite picture. And, and what's really striking is you can see where the lights are on and where the lights are off. So the lights are on very brightly where we are in Europe and Japan. There's a really bright spot right there in a bright island off the coast of Asia here. What's that island? No, it's South Korea. Oops, it's not an island. There's actually a dark spot up there that's North Korea. And that really bright spot is Seoul. But the point is in the, in the developed world, the lights are on really bright. And the energy is burning in America at a rate of 11 kilowatts per person. In, in, in India and China, where almost half the world's people live, it's more like two kilowatts per person and rising towards a higher number. And in the, and, and in the, the third world, you, you really got no lights, but all these lights are going to turn on. And so you can, basically the amount of energy you use is proportional to the amount of money you make. And as the population of the world increases and as the industrialization of the world increases, so does its energy use. And so you can project, I think Amy had these figures yesterday, we're going to need another 16 terawatts between now and 2050, maybe sooner. And it's an environmental disaster if we do this all with fossil fuel. And if you look at the capacities, the inventory of energy we could get out of all the other carbon-free sources, they, they really don't add up to, to, to give us this. But if you think about solar, solar is, has a, has a terrestrial potential 
um, at, of, of, that's really enormous compared to the scale of energy use. Right? 600 terawatts. And, and so, you know, if we can convert uh, 1 20th of that, we're good for, for the long foreseeable future. Um, but we need very efficient solar cells because the cost really goes as the area of the solar cell, whatever it's made of. And so all the costs, the cost of the modules and, and everything drop as the area drops, the cost of the installation. And that means we really need highly efficient solar cells. The other interesting thing about solar is it's a decentralized resource. So in places like Africa, uh, uh, you know, you see devices like this, and even if they're expensive in terms of cost per watt, they enable people to do things they can't normally do, like put together jigsaw puzzles on a school night, or uh, have a hospital that doesn't lose power because it has a solar charge battery. Okay, so there, there are basically three ways to um, convert uh, sunlight into useful energy. And photosynthesis is about 1% efficient, so this is a non-starter for um, energy production on the 16 terawatt scale. This is how we make food. We want to continue to eat food. We can't burn it. Okay. Um, this is also a sort of a non-starter, even though a lot of us work on this. And so I, <laughs> I won't discuss this too much. But, uh, but the, the problem with coupling solar cell to, to difficult catalytic reactions, at least for now, is the overpotential for those reactions is so big that the, the efficiency of this process is quite low. This is, a, this is a good process where there are already lots of materials that are about 10 to 20 percent efficient. And this is, this is the technology that is maybe 10 years away from grid parity in the United States. Um, there's another, I mean, there's, uh, of course, it's important to work on this because only 20% of our energy economy is electricity, and the other 80% is currently fuel. And so we really need a way to make fuel. It's just, this is a really hard problem. Okay, fuel is cheap, and if you make it from electricity, you're kind of going the wrong way with the Carnot cycle, so you have to be really, really good at fuel. Okay, um, I think Maggie showed a slide very similar to this, uh, where if we make a liquid junction or a junction with a metal in a semiconductor, basically we have this equilibration of Fermi levels by the electron, some electrons going from the material with the higher Fermi level into the one with the lower Fermi level. And the idea is that the number of electrons you've got available is much, much greater in the solution than it is in the semiconductor. So this thing moves up only an infinitesimal amount when you do that. And this, this Fermi level moves down a lot as you deplete electrons in this space charge layer. And so now you make something that's got an electric field here that acts as a diode in the dark. And the way electrical engineers draw diodes, they draw them with the P side on the back end of the arrow and the N side on the front end of the arrow. So an N-type semiconductor um, can do uh, a reduction if we apply a negative potential to this. It can do a reduction in the dark, but it can't do an oxidation. Another way to, to think of this is uh, the convention in, for engineers, electrical engineers, is the current is the direction of positive charge flow. I guess that convention has been with us since before we knew that electrons were the things that carry the charge. And so positive current can go that way. That means negative current can go that way in the diode. If we make this a p-type semiconductor, we flip this diode around. And so we can do an oxidation in the dark with a p-type semiconductor. And uh, so this is, this is what the IV curve of the diode looks like in the, in the uh, solution of the redox couple. This is what a metal looks like is following the Butler-Volmer equation. Okay, uh, so uh, these are sort of you know, exponential curves before we hit the mass transfer limit. This one does it in only one direction, and that's because we basically move this Fermi level up to the point where um, now uh, we have lots of electrons right at the surface, and they can go into the 
and the oxycodone kind of solution. In this situation, the electrons are depleted for a distance of tens of tens or hundreds of nanometers uh, away from the interface. So where there are lots of electrons, they're just too far away to tunnel through that barrier into the solution. So we can do a reduction in the dark. Eventually, if you go positive enough, you will get will drive this semiconductor into some kind of breakdown mode. You will get not a current, but you have to go very far positive to do that. And a solid state diode will work the same way. I think I'll picture one of those in a second. Here's a solid state diode. Okay, now usually in in my undergraduate course, we don't get into the quantitative um, business of how to describe the current in the diode and the solar cell. But there's a wonderful website that has all this stuff and it has lots of little applets where you can put in your own values of say the shunt resistance and the fill factor in the, in the solar cell and 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 calculate uh, all these power curves and everything. Uh, and it's it's re it's a really great site uh, it was developed by uh, Christina Hansberg from uh, Arizona. University of Arizona, so um, that's that's really worth it. So, but basically, you see where these equations come from, what the equivalent circuit of a solar cell is, etc. The important thing here is we have this diode current that's basically exponential, and this is the dark current in the diode. When we put this in the sunlight, we make electron hole pairs, and they actually go the opposite way; they run in the back bias direction. So we're effectively taking this diode IV curve and we're adding a current source that, if, that just takes this and sort of moves it down the current axis. And so you get a power curve that looks like this. Uh, it's just the sum of some photocurrent minus this dark current that's the same term up here. And that's, that's how we understand the equivalent circuit and the, and the current and the source, and why the power curve has this sort of shape. What we always want to do is operate the solar cell at some point on this curve where we maximize the area of a rectangle that we draw from this axis over to whatever point we have, this maximum power curve. So the more, this, the more square this curve is, the more rec uh, rectangular it is, the better solar cell we've got. And so uh, I think Amy mentioned this too, but there's, uh, depending on the band gap of the solar cell, there's a different theoretical efficiency. If the, if the band gap is too, too small, then um, you're, you're going to be wasting a lot of the absorbed light as heat because you're exciting holes from way down the valence band up to the conduction band. And in a picosecond or so, that energy is thermalized as the electron pole gets to the band edges. If you choose a semiconductor that's too has a, a too large a band gap, then a lot of the red photons in the solar spectrum just aren't going to get absorbed because they're not energetic enough to, to go all the way from the valence to the conduction band. So there's a sweet spot around 1.4 eV, which is in the uh, infrared, near infrared, that gives you the maximum possible power conversion efficiency, thermodynamic limit of, of 32 percent. It's this chocolate piece limit in one sum. And you have 33 or something like that. That may be that may be in concentrated. Like that. Okay. Okay. Anyway, that's a that's a long introduction to get to what it's talking about. Now, silicon. This is a this is of course the material that's the the industry leader for solar cells. And the reason is we make a lot of it for computer chips. And we're pretty good at making these big single crystals. Okay, this is, these are the things they make 12 inch wafers out of. So that's a foot wide and many feet long. It's all one big single crystal. Uh, and um, it has to be very, very pure, very, very pure for solar cells. The reason is, um, as, uh, as we've heard already, um, doping, a little bit of doping, I think this was in, uh, Maggie went over this, a little bit of doping goes a long way towards changing the conductivity. So if you have an intrinsic carrier concentration of 10 to the, um, 
10 to the 10 or 10 to the 11 uh, carriers per cc, if you put a little bit of junk in there, you, you really change uh, the, the doping. Now, now, what does a silicon solar cell look like? And this is getting to the research part of the talk, even though I'm not working over my time, sorry. Uh, the uh, silicon solar cell, you, you see it drawn with a PN junction somewhere in the middle, but that's not the way they make a silicon solar cell. A silicon solar cell is all P-type, and it's got this skinny little N-type layer on the top that's corrugated to make an anti-reflection coating. And then it has a top contact and the bottom contact. The reason for this is, if you, if you look at the, the width of the space charge layer as a function of doping density, um, if you have lots of doping, like one doping for every 10 atoms, then your space charge layer is only a nanometer thick. And that doesn't make a good rectifier. Electrons can tunnel right through that. So that kind of acts like a metal electrode. If, you're, if you have a, a nice doping density like 10 to the 17, your space charge layer is only 100 nanometers thick. And, and this goes as the square root. So if you drop that down to 10 to the 13, you, you only make, you know, by a factor of 10 to the 4, you only make that 100 times thicker. The silicon solar cell has got to be 200 microns thick to absorb all the light because it's an indirect gap material. And so there's no way to make the doping density low enough and still have this thing conduct and have a field all the way across this. So the field only exists right up here. Essentially, all the electron pole pairs are made in the field-free region, and they just drift around. And if they get lucky, they find their way up here. And they get lucky most of the time in really pure silicon. You get all the junk and all the defects out of it and make this back contact a really good reflector for minority carriers, and, and they all make it. But that requires really pure materials. So we wanted to ask, can we use junky materials? And how would you do that? And if, you're, you know, if you're not making a new material, but you're just making a different shape. So, so this is the idea of nanowire solar cells, nano and microwire. The idea is now we're going to separate this very long length scale of light absorption from the length scale of charge separation by putting the interface uh, always close to the uh, where the light is absorbed, and and so uh, and further, if these are nanocrystals, it's pretty easy to make single crystals if they're small. And another effect that we didn't realize when we started in this, but but this is well known uh, in optics literature, if you make a, a, a brush of high index objects, even if they're not filling the space very well, and ours only filled maybe three percent of the area. They are very, very good light traps because it's, there's a kind of optical waveguiding effect out of the low index and into the high index material in that kind of brush. So we started on this um, working with John Redwin, making silicon nanowires by a vapor liquid solid growth technique where you have little dots of gold on the surface of uh, typically a, a either an aluminum membrane, inside an aluminum membrane, or on a silicon wafer. They catalyze the decomposition of silicon and boron uh, precursors in the gas phase. They make a, a liquid alloy that eventually gets supersaturated and nucleates a crystal of silicon, and that just grows like a beanstalk. Okay, so you get this forest of little silicon uh, whiskers. This is a film that grows in about 10 minutes, um, and it's uh, something like, this one is something like 25 microns thick, which in this geometry is enough to absorb all the light because of that, that optical wave back. And the way, the way we uh, tested these initially was just to make electrodes, and then it's just a whole lot easier to make a liquid junction than it is to make a solid state PN junction solar cell. So we tested these with a, with a redox couple, Rubipi, uh, which, you know, this is also used as a dye, but we're just using it as a, as a dark redox color. And in the light, uh, the light and the dark, you see very different behavior. So in the dark, this thing is a, is a good diode. 
Okay? We don't get uh, uh, any dark current and negative bias. But we can do a reduction in the light because that's the, uh, for P-type silicon, that's the back bias direction. Okay? And if you compare the potential at which that reduction occurs to just a metal electrode, the, the difference is the photovoltage. And that's a, that's a, a little better than 200 milliwatts, which is nothing to write home about. A good silicon solar cell should be more like 600 or 700 millivolts. But this is showing a kind of sign of life and showing us you know, where we need to start. What we didn't realize, actually, at the time was that making really skinny wires isn't so good. Uh, if you make them thicker, as I'll show you in a second, the dark current density goes down, the photovoltage goes up. What was also cool, though, is we saw this moth-eye effect. Uh, that is, uh, just about five microns worth of silicon is enough to absorb all the light. And for any uh, electrochemistry buffs out there, a another cool thing happens, which is if you, if you take these cyclical tamograms in the light, where you mass transfer limited in the photocomb, and you compare the current density at a planar silicon wafer to the, to the wire array electrode. The slope of this line is exactly twice the slope of that line. That's because in this case, you're getting diffusion from two directions, above and below where that band of light absorption is. And in this case, you're only getting diffusion from one direction. So it's semi-infinite planar diffusion in both cases. And that's diagnostic. In fact, it's the wires that are doing the work. But anyway, then the story uh, changed because uh, at this point, um, this is such a good idea that some of my friends, um, uh, Charlie Lieber, uh, Nate Lewis, and Peyton Yang, all decided to throw like 19 postdocs into it. <laughs> and, 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 and Nate has like um, some large amount of money, like a bajillion dollars to do this. Okay. So, so <laughs> anyway, they're now making really beautiful wires. Um, with the same similar technique with uh, using copper as a, as a catalyst. And that's very nice because you can get rid of all the copper at the end by etching. And making really, really nice uh, 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 silicon wires that, that show all these effects and are now getting pretty respectable uh, solar efficiencies, both for uh, electricity generation and water spill. And so this is one of the reasons why we put work. Not before we decided to do uh, a project on chocolate pyrites, which we heard about yesterday. And it, um, uh, Amy talked about this one, and that there are lots of good reasons to work on this one. We were interested in, uh, in SIGs because um, it's, it's a really wonderful material. It has a band gap of 1.1 EV. It has a basically very forgiving interface with, with cadmium sulfide. So you can make pretty junky SIGs. As Amy showed, these polycrystalline electrodes are now getting 17-18% uh, efficiency. And, and so um, basically what we did was grow them as wires. And, and you know, electrochemistry is a, is a cheap and scalable technique for, for making stuff. It's a, uh, and what we did is simply electroplate um, copper and indium and selenium from aqueous solutions into the pores of these alumina membranes, which you make by anodizing aluminum, or you get um, buy them from the store with these larger uh, uh, pore sizes, 350 di uh, nanometer diameter, but the, the membranes are about 60 microns wide. And you can plate these things at different potentials and get different stoichiometries of copper and indium dicylene. So now the, the material as prepared has very tiny grains, about two mm -hmm. nanometers, and so the x-ray lines are broad. But if you anneal them at 400 degrees, which is still uh, perfectly fine for these membranes, uh, nothing happens to them up to about 500, 600 degrees. Uh, you get much sharper lines, and we can dissolve the membrane, get the wires out, and look at them in the TEM. And what you see is a grain structure, so they're not single crystal. 
as they start in very tiny numbers. But the grain size here is kind of consistent with what we see up here from the Scherer equation, about 40 nanometers. And we don't see, uh, at least at the limit where we can tell by X-ray, that is a few percent, we don't see other uh, binary phases that, that uh, can be byproducts of the synthesis. Also, we do uh, EDS, which Ray discussed yesterday, element mapping, and we see an even distribution of the appropriate elements in the layers. Now, the question is, um, how do, can we control the doping and measure? So, the solution contains, on purpose, more indium than copper. And so, let me ask, which, which ion is easier to reduce, copper or indium? Copper, right? Copper is one of the least active metals. So we have more indium than copper. So as we change the potential, okay, at low over potential, we're going to get something copper rich. At higher over potential, we're going to get more indium. And, th and this allows us to, to tune the, the balance of it. And so we can make the wires copper rich or indium rich. And the question is, what what um, what doping type would we expect for copper indium rich? Let me just show you what we get. So so this is just depending on the stoichiometry, the potential. If it's if the potential is too low. Then we get a lot of copper, and this is really very far off the stoichiometry we want. So these wires, are, we wouldn't expect them to be any good. But these are pretty close to 1 to 1 to 2. However, you see at 700 millivolts, we have a little more copper, and at 750, a little more indium than stoichiometry. And um, so uh, and th these are fairly accurate numbers. Uh, we, we, we get this from, from uh, ICP, Atomic Emission Spectroscopy, so we sort of are getting, you know, three-digit accuracy analysis here. Um, so, so, what do we, so for CuInSe2, what do we expect? Should this guy be P-type or N-type? Somebody said P-type. That's right. Why is that? Right, right. So we put copper on the indium site. And I, I'm running really long, and I should probably skip. No, no, no. Oh, really? Oh, oh okay. So what I wanted to show you, another thing you can do, th this is a concept that really gets pretty hard for students with um, uh, complex stoichiometries like this, and especially something like quaternaries uh, like, like CZTS. If you ask somebody, you put some zinc on the tin site, what's it going to do? So what I like to do when, when I have a hard concept, um, and this and also the polarity of the, the diode and stuff like that, I, I, I like to put the lyrics in a, in a song, okay? And this is one we did, and, and the, I got to apologize for the video. I, I didn't do the, the video, I just did the song and the... Um, if anybody knows how to make a music video, uh, please talk to me. This one was made by an undergrad who plagiarized the thing about it, though, is you'll see Justin Timberlake actually singing our lyrics. Listen.
so serious. <laughs> yeah, I guess he has, you know, Sony uh, Entertainment Group doesn't have as much sense of humor, so they, they have it yanked off YouTube for you know, copyright infringement. <laughs> And the, you can download the video from the reports. <laughs> but um, no, but seriously, the, the the problem is just the use of his video. The, it's a, you can write a parody song. And cares. But anyway, so we got this right. So if you have copper on the indium sites, that's P-type. Indium on the copper sites is N-type. 
And then, so then the question is, how do you measure this? And the ways to measure this, if you if you ask a physicist, they'll say, well, you really got to do, uh, you know, Hall effect measurement, and that's never a bad idea. But actually, there's this really simple electrochemical method that we can use that basically relies on the fact that the equivalent circuit of this thing in the dark uh, is, a, is a simple one. So, so this is the, this is the semiconductor solution interface. The solution has some resistance. There's a double layer capacitance, right, because we have that ionic double layer right at the surface. And then there's a space charge capacitance of the, the uh, you know, where the bands are bent. But if, if you remember uh, two capacitors in series, um, if one is much larger than the other, you can forget about the large one. The large one looks like a short circuit. And so the, the double layer capacitance, because the double layer is very thin, is always much larger than the space charge capacitance. And so you can model this equivalent circuit like this, and you can do an AC impedance um, measurement and get both R and C, and especially what you want is the space charge capacitance as a function of potential. Because as the bands bend, when we bend the bands in, in, uh, in depletion and, and, and back bias the diode, the width of the space charge layer grows. So the capacitor gets thicker and the capacitance goes down. And as we get closer and closer to the flat band condition and closer to this condition where we now start passing current in the dark, the space charge layer shrinks and shrinks and shrinks and that capacitance goes up, up, up. And so the Machaki equation says if I plot one over the capacitance squared, um, the intercept of this line is going to be very near the flat band potential, and that's going to correspond to this condition. And it's a you get a linear plot. You plot one over capacitance squared versus applied potential in the depletion region and extrapolate back to here. And you can do that for both p-type and n-type. Very simple measurement that we do, we, we take the wires out of the membrane, we make a suspension and just put a drop of those in, uh, in a solvent on, on an electrode surface to do this measurement. So these are, these are drop cast, one, I don't remember, these may have been right in the membrane, or they may have been drop cast. But e either way, you can do this mach Schottky plot. The slope of the line, in principle, tells you the doping density, but then you need to know that it's actually the doping density times the surface area, and this, our surface area is not well defined. But this intercept tells you against the reference electrode where the, the valence band is, edges, and where the conduction band edge is. So you can map the band edges of your semiconductor relative to the redox scale this way and get an idea of the doping density, which we, we confirm the doping density from resistance measurements from individual wires. And as you'd expect, this doping level is a little too high because we had something like four to eight percent non-stoichiometry. Uh, we'd really like to knock this down by a factor of 10 to 100, and then these ought to be reasonably good wires then for solar cells. Uh, if we can uh, get them down to 10 to the 17 range. Okay, so that's how we characterize them. And I apologize for running long. But I want to just thank the people who contributed to this. So the silicon nanowire team was Adrian Goody, who did uh, most of the work. We collaborated with my colleagues Joan Redwing on the VLS growth and Teresa Mayer on the measurements. And their students, uh, Sarah Eichfeld uh, and Yang Tang Wang, and Yu Xiao was a postdoc and took this over with Adrian. And then uh, the two guys who worked on the, the CUINIC2 wires were Emil Hernandez, who's now a postdoc. At, uh, Tennessee, and uh, uh, Tiger Wong, who's still here and finishing up his PhD, and uh, DOE paid So thank you very much. Uh, sorry about the time.